I was having lunch in a restaurant in Cali, in Cali, Colombia. And 10, 10 hitmen uh, got to where I was and, and it was a disaster. There were six people dead. And I decided to call my wife and say like goodbye to her because, you know, I don't know, something. And, and I pick, pick up the, my cell phone, I call her. I talked to her, tell her that I love her and, 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 and protect my kid. I don't know why I say that. And when I hook, when I, you know, I, I finished the call, immediately the guys got up and then two of those guys start shooting at us. And, and unfortunately for me, I tried to, you know, get up. That saved my life because I would have been hit in my, in my, in my, in my face. So. And uh, you know the inertia of the, of the shots threw me back. So I fell in another table. The table comes on top of me. And unfortunately, one of my friends got hit here. And he immediately, you know, all the blood was by my side. And then I, I lay down and I was like, you know, making that I was dead. But I was seeing this guy move from here, from there. And it was, there was, you know, there were, there were seconds, but for me it was like an hour, you know, this guy. And when the guy decided to go, you know, I, and then I, I called for help. Right, so today we have got a exclusive interview with William, whose book we have just brought out. It's the son of the Cali cartel. And we're going to be getting into a hell of a lot of detail about that shortly. But before I begin, you know, many of you are familiar with William's story if you've watched Narcos, which was a misrepresentation of the actual truth. And we're going to get to that as well. But this is a massive story because the Cali cartel at the peak, they took over from Escobar and they were moving tens of billions in cocaine worldwide. It did become the biggest distribution cartel in the world. And many of you are familiar with the four heads of the Cali cartel. So you've got Chepe, Pacho, and then you've got Miguel, which is William's dad. And then you've got Gilberto, his brother, the, uh, um, the chess player, the chess player. So mm -hmm. only Miguel is the surviving one. Sadly, Gilberto died earlier. Um, it was this year, wasn't it, that he died? Yeah, he, he died the 1st of, of June of this year. 1st of June this year. Okay. So... William was the acting head of the cartel when the bosses, the surviving bosses, went to jail. So can you imagine running a cartel that was shipping that much product and was worth, you know, the revenue in the tens of billions a year? So the story is going to be absolutely breathtaking. But a huge thank you for coming on, William. No chance. Thank you for inviting me. You know, it's a pleasure. And thank you so much for believing in my in my book and, and how we can, you know make people interested in that and knowing this story because I believe this kind of story has to be told so they don't repeat this, you know, because that's that's the problem, no? My, my story is a little bit more critical. I don't glorify like, you know, Netflix does. I try to tell the truth of what the things that happen in our family and in this organization. All right, and before we get to how this all began then, there is a story at the beginning of the book where there's an assassination attempt on your life. And for people interested in the book, link will be in the description box below this video, as will links for Reese Dry, who is managing William. So anyone wants to coordinate anything with William, go down in the description box and check out Reese Dry's email and links. So could you could you set up the scene for what happened that day of the assassination attempt? Yeah, I am. Um... It happened in 96, it was May of 96. And we, we was having some problems with another uh, cartel, the North Valley cartel. And so I was, you know, I was having lunch in a restaurant in Cali, in Cali, Colombia. 
in 10, 10 hitments, uh, got to where I was and, and it was a disaster. There were six people dead and I was the only one who survived this, this at the end of my life. Uh, I received eight bullets in my body and only God changed me, you know, for, you know, because he was the one who protected me and gave me a second chance to change my life. It was a very critical moment in, uh, in this story for me because, you know, uh, I lost a lot of people that I care about. I lost two of my greatest friends and I, I love some, and I lost some people and my bodyguards that were close to me. And it changed my life, you no, know, forever because, you know, sometimes you believe you're in touch and, so, and in situations like this, uh, wakes you up of that trance that I was, you no, know, because I believe I could do anything and I was invincible. And, and God taught me that day that he was the only power and, and changed my life. You no, know? it's not it's not easy. Uh, surviving that and psychology psychology way, it was very difficult for me because, you know, like I said, the wounds are in your body heal, but those things are there forever and all those those memories will stay there and and it really changed my life no because it it, it, it taught me a lesson no but it was not so simple John because you know I was not you were not my 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 boss or my my partner or my father so I had some responsibility and I had to continue try to help in them and to run this this organization no in, in the part of the political corruption and 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 try to you know and try to fight a, a war that was lost at the moment that we started because when you fight against the the americans is difficult because in the end you have to make a bargain with them or or they'll finish you off and that's what happened my father and uncle uh, decided to go in a in a war uh a war uh uh, like, uh, you know, th there are different types of war. And, and we went to the United States, you know, like a legal war. Uh, and, and in the end, we want to lose. So but that's what I say. They, they, we began that, that confrontation with them. And in the end, we were, we were going to lose because they have the power and they destroyed us in the end. All right. So on this day then of the assassination, can you remember how that day started for you? Were you with your family? Yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, you know, th this is started the, the, the day after because, you know, those guys hit on two of our guys who ran our, all, all our, our, our power, you know, in the street. And, and I don't know, I don't know what, why uh, I, I believe that, that there was like a normal thing that happened to one of the, those guys that worked with us. Uh, but I should have been, you know, alert. And that day I, I wake up and, and I was going to go to a, a nearby town uh, of Cali. It's called Buga because there's like a saint that I was devoted to. And I was having, you know, breakfast and my friend that I was going to go with him to, to, to that city came to my house. And then my, my aunt called me. I used to run the soccer game, the soccer team of, uh, of my family. You know, we had a soccer team called America Cali. And we were doing a big business with a player we were selling to Portugal. So she told me that, that she needed me in the office. So I, I decided not to go to visit the saint. And then I went to you know the office of, of the America of Cali and, and I did the deal. And then I decided that there was time to go to lunch. And then I invited them to a Brazilian restaurant. And that's when they, those, this, this unfortunately situation happened. Who were the people you had invited to lunch and what were your relationships with them? Uh, one was my friend, uh, when the, uh, a close friend of mine that I was, you know, he was my buddy when we were 15 years old. And the other one was a guy who worked with me, but he was like a friend too, because he always was with me flying to Bogota and helping me with, with my business. And, and one of our top men, uh, they used to run our guys in the street, you know, and I invited him to, to lunch. 
there was a, my cousin too. He was going to go, but unfortunately, in those the, he was called and he didn't go. And then we went to that restaurant to find some of them to find the death, their death. So when you go to lunch like that, because of the business you were in back then, what security precautions are in place? But as you know, that, 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 that's, that's, that's the main thing of, of this story. Because, you know, I believe I was untouchable. I believe nobody could to do nothing because I, went, I was Miguel Rodriguez's son. I didn't have precaution at those moments. I only went with two guys. They were my bodyguards and the other and the other guy that I told you, Nicole, was his name, my friend. So I, I, I should have known and been surrounded for 10 or 15 guys. But that day I, I gave the, the opportunity and that's why I, I lost. OK, and you said this was a hit by the North Valley Cartel. Valley Cartel. Can you explain then to people who are or who were the North Valley Cartel and why you guys were in a war with them? Because th this is cyclical, no? First word is Escobar, the guy, the main guy. We helped them destroy him. And then we became the number one. And then th this, this business is stupid for me because when you a guy is up there, you want to take him down. And, you, and, and when you take him down, you're going to get the heat. So that's something that I don't understand. No, you should, they should, you should have an umbrella and the umbrella will... Which you, will, will help you, you know, survive. But these guys, everybody wants to be number one. So these guys started, you know, like making up stories about us. We were, my father and uncle were in jail. Chepe was in jail, and we didn't have the the, the same power because you start losing, you no? Know? Because you start, you know, we start retiring from the the drug business, and you start to lose money, power, and and these guys were, you know. Getting in the place that we were, they were, they were the now the new drug lords, and 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 we got in for some, you know, people talking things that were not true, and something that Chepe did too to to one of those guys. So it was like a, you know, they started like making up stories to try to get in a conflict with us, and and I had to go to a lot of meetings, you know, to try to to clarify, you know some stuff they were saying and that, that was that, that's when my life became a hell because i had i always was called for those guys and i have to go no this is not this this is not that we're, you know but i believe when you say the truth you always will will survive and get out but in the end this is a very dangerous business and 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 in the end if if you don't be aware you're gonna be hit or you or you're gonna lose your everything okay so how far into the meal were you when these guys struck? No, I finished, I was finished. I was asking for the check. Uh, you know, something happened, no? something crazy happened, you know? And I decided to call my wife and say like goodbye to her because, you know, I don't know, something. And, and I pick, pick up the, my cell phone, I call her. I talk to her, tell her that I love her and, 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 and protect my kid. I don't know why I say that and when I hook, when I, you know, I I finished the call, immediately the guys got up and then two of those guys start shooting at us. And, and I, I, unfortunately for me, I tried to, you know, get up. They saved my life because uh, I would have been hit in my, in my, in my, in my face. So I got hit here, here and, and down. And so I don't know, it was fate, no? I don't know. Nobody, it's very difficult to survive. And, one shot, you know, now I, I got hit eight times. So it was a miracle. Do you remember how the assassins were dressed? Yeah, the guy who hit me and that's what that 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 image will be for life in my head. He had like jeans, blue jeans, and he had like a blue shoes. And, uh, and, uh, and when I fell down, because I got up and, uh, you know, the inertia of the, of the shots threw me back. So I felt... And another table, the table comes on top of me. And unfortunately, one of my friends got hit here. And he immediately, you know, all the blood was by my side. And then I, I lay down and I was like, you know, making that I was dead. But I was seeing this guy move from here, from there. And it was, there was, you know, were, there were seconds, but for me, it was like an hour, you know, this guy. And when the guy decided to go, you know, I, and then I, I called for help. I try no, I tried to get up, but 
one bullet was broke my knee and I couldn't get up. If I didn't broke my knee, I would have gotten would have gotten up because I don't know. You know, I, I I didn't understand because when I fell down, the first thing you when you are in those situations, that, that, that's the way you think. No, you the first thing you think is in God. And I, the first word I say, God, save me, my little kid. Th uh, this is not fair. That's what I said in my mind. And and I tell you, when I finished to say that, I didn't know why I felt so calm. I don't know if it was my blood was coming out or not, but I felt calm and I did I know. In that moment, I, I was not going to die. Had you ever been shot before, William, or was that the first time? No, it was the first time. Okay, and when the bullets come in you, did your adrenaline just go so high and the pain comes later, or did the pain come right away? No, the, you, didn't, you didn't feel pain. You know, I, feel, I felt like something was in my, in my stomach, stuck in my stomach. But <laughs> one day I, I, I was, this is something I'm going to tell I was, I was, I met a guy who was a, a top leader of the M19, one of the, that he surrendered himself, one of the top uh, gorillas groups. And he was a friend of mine, you know, and the guy was shot too. So the guy was so crazy and he told me, right, William, that when, when you're dying, that's cool because you start going in, in, in that trance that you are in, you know, because, you know, blood is coming out and then you, you're relaxed and, and that's it. I believe that there was the way I was calm because the blood was coming out. I lost almost half of the, the blood in my body. When you made the call home before the shooting commenced and you said goodbye, do you think that subconsciously you had picked up on some kind of danger? Maybe, maybe. I don't know why I did that. You know, like I, I was saying goodbye to my wife. Yeah, so it's, it's crazy, you know, because I believe that that day was my day. I think I should have died that day. I don't know why God decided to save me because that day I was going to die. Because, you know, nobody survives something like that. If God is not there for you. So did you say that there were three other people with you and they died? Yeah, they, they, they were, we were sitting three and me four. And downstairs were two guys that were killed and with silencer. And, and the other three guys were my, my two bodies and, and my bodyguard and were killed. And what about the assassins? Did they, any of them get killed or did they manage to escape? No, because remember that, that day I gave them the chance. I never would give chance to them because from that day on, I always were protected by a lot of people around me because that's, that's we call it in Spanish, la hora del bo, like the, the, the hour of the dumb. Everybody has in a moment uh, in their life. And that was mine. I gave the chance and, and that why, that's why they got to me. All right, so you're on the floor. You can see the blood now. You can't feel the pain because you're adrenaline. What's going through your head at that point? No, when when they these guys uh, ran away, and uh, you know, uh, the first is to help, call for help, and you know, for unfortunately for me, there was my aunt was there. The sister of my father was having lunch in the same restaurant, so I called her, and she comes and look at me, and she goes run, and I told her call an ambulance. And then uh, they uh, they start you know like thinking we we cannot put you down because they're gonna come back and hit you and I say no get me downstairs because it was a second floor and then they they come down and they put me on the floor and then you know some like a like a miracle I believe two police guys came in a in a motorcycle and I said these guys are gonna hit me again no but no these guys were like 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 angels that came in and I, and the guy came and say hey. What happened and so hey I'm, I'm this guy please don't don't stay here don't don't move from my side so that guy the police guy died with a with a with a it was like a a changa changa i believe was it was there and he was by my side and then the ambulance was then the ambulance comes and they want to take one of my bodyguards that has a bullet in in the head because he was alive still was alive and then uh and then the guy didn't want to take me. So I, I call him and say, hey, you can take us too. I can, I can survive, you know? So no, and I, and I got him from here and throw him down and say, hey man, I can save myself. So they put my bodyguard, Fernando, in, 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 in I don't know how, the stretcher, you call it, and put him in. And I went 
like you see the ambulance has like a like a seats all around and I, and I, and I went laying down that there so they took me to the hospital and like when I got there in two minutes my wife was there and then my cousin was there and they say what happened and I told my my, my cousin those are sorry about the word those are the, the word I'm gonna say those two motherfuckers you have to hide <laughs> so it's and... yeah go on, keep going yeah, and then my wife was there and she saw me and you know I was I was so calm, I don't know why. I believe it was the other thing. it was you know like I was dying and my blood was going down. I was very calm. And then the, another another miracle happens, you know, that's something when you're you're not gonna die, you're not gonna die. My my medical uh, general me medic was there, he was gonna operate somebody, and then he's, he sees me, and immediately the guy throws throws me in, in the operation room. And the guy saved my life. The guy was like, when I saw the guy, it was like I saw God. You know, the, the guy they, they didn't let me die that day. You had a few guardian angels that day. Going back to the other guardian angels, then it's quite common in Colombia for a hitman to dress as a cop. And you said as these cops were approaching you, then you thought it's it was going to happen again. Yeah, yeah, it was. You know, I say this, this is it. But you know, fortunately, the guy. Was not involved in in in, in the hit, and, and the guy was an angel that sat there and protecting me. But for that moment, when you thought it was going to happen again, did you just brace and accept that there was nothing you could do? Yeah, I cannot do nothing. I cannot do nothing because I cannot move myself. I don't have nothing. So, yeah, it was like if it happened, it happened. No, it's, it was God's decision. No, but He decided the opposite to let me live. But for, for a second there, it must have been terrifying. Yeah, but you know, I don't know why I was so calm. I don't explain myself. I so I was I I from that moment that I tell told you that I talked to this guy, that I talked to God, I was calm. You know, I knew I was not going to die that day. I knew that that was not my day. I don't know if I put it in my head and that saved me, but but I was positive, hundred percent that I was not going to die. So at this point, then, where were Miguel and Gilberto? They were in prison. They were in Bogota in, in a prison called La Picota. They were there. It was very hard for them, you know. Yeah, but yeah, things happened. And I went to operation. I, I wake up like uh, the operation was like five hours. Like at eight o'clock, I, I I wake up. I was my, my, my wife was on my side. And then my and then my father calls and. And the first thing that I told my father that day is, Father, I'm alive. This is a war we cannot win. And I, 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 I knew they, those guys were hearing me. That was the message that I had to give because if I would have said something else, maybe they would come again for me. So I knew what I had to say. And, and really, it was, it was the truth. I knew that in that moment, those guys, we, we will lost that war because they had the police, they had um, the the gorillas they had a lot of people and we had a lot of family innocent family that would be lost if we decided to go to war with those guys what was your father's reaction when you first told him that no nah, he come himself he was you know but always he, he told me if i was well, how i was feeling that how did i feel and i said no, don't worry father i'll survive Just think about the other family members uh, and and unfortunately, you know, uh, we could, you know, resolve this issue with these people. And it was difficult because, you know, there were people who will help you and people who wanted war because the the guys who made the hits they they charge when you you kill people. That's that's the when they when they make money. So it was it was complicated, no. But in the end, you know, sense came true and. And then we decided to to join, you know, like uh, join forces to fight against projects in, in Congress that were very important against drug trafficking. And those guys wanted me to, you know, help them with that because I had the experience. So that that saved my life too, I believe, you know. But that's there were very difficult moments, Sean, for me because, you know, uh, I was. Every day was, uh, you know, surviving death, surviving prison. But that's that life that I choose. And, and that's why I made so much mistakes. And I had to suffer for my bad 
anxious. So are you saying from their perspective then, in the immediate aftermath, it was an unsuccessful hit because you survived? Yeah, sure. Because in the end, they say I was not that object, but it was incredible. There was those guys uh, will do a hit and don't know who was there. No, that's, that's stupid to know when, when people who were very organized, people who ran police and everything, they knew I was there, you know, but, but in the end, I, I was survived and, and some people help us and, and we could resolve this issue, no? Because in the end, when you cannot make, you can, you, you, you when you are okay, when you're going to go to war, you have to think about it because sometimes there are wars that you're not going to, when you're not going to win the war, you have to make, you know, peace talks and bargain. And, and that's, and that's what we did. And because we had to survive, there were a lot of innocent people. We had a lot of people, you know, easy to, to be, you know, hit. And we, we got a big, very big family and there are people that didn't have nothing to do with what we were doing. So you just said that they said you weren't the target. Who did they say was the target? My, my, my main guy, the guy who ran, you know, he, he was a guy who, who had a lot of people in the street and, and that's why they want to take, take him down. But they, I believe the guy who wanted the war, there was, his name was Varela. He, he wanted to take out uh, two birds with one stone because this guy was a guy who ran a lot of people in the street and I was the, the political power of this organization in that moment. Wow. This is such a compelling story, William. I appreciate all the detail you've given us on this, and it must be true. Yeah, but I'm telling, I'm telling all the story in, in the books, and nobody wanna, is gonna gonna read the book. <laughs> I think they certainly will. It's right here. <laughs> it's right here. Go down to the description box and check out the link, because there's a hell of a lot more detail in the book. All right, let let let's go back then, and and just set the stage for this, because in in the Western speaking world, the people think it all just revolves about Pablo Escobar. And they've seen the narcos and the DA go in and they're the good guys and they kick the bad guys' asses. But it's far more complex than that. I mean, the whole thing goes back to the violence in Colombia, doesn't it? There was a civil war called the violence. And could you just tell the viewers a little bit about that war, the violence, what it was about? The problem, we have, we have to go back to... Let's go back to 78 to 84. That, that was like a paradise for everybody in Colombia because everybody was making money. Drug trafficking was like almost, almost legal because, you know, the banks are making money, the rich people are making money with, with these new, you know, rich guys in the block. And, and, but then this guy, Escobar, decided that he wanted to be president of Colombia. You know, the, the great mistake he made because the guys who ran our country for more than 100 years, there are 10 families in Colombia. They want to permit that somebody who come from there will, you know, be in power in, in Colombia. So when, when he was out, outside of, of political, they wanted him because they were receiving a lot of, you know, benefits. But now he's, he's getting in, involved in stuff that he shouldn't get involved. And then the problem has started. They, he ran, he won, he won, he was a congressman. And then they took out all, all a lot of stuff that he had in the past, you know, he was cut, he, he was cash with some drugs in a moment. Then they put that in the, in the, in the medias. And then this guy got crazy and, he, in, and then decided he was going to make the range against the political uh, who were uh, not with him. So he started to kill, you know, important people. And then he started putting bombs in Colombia. And now the thing that was good, you know, I'm not saying it was good. I'm saying that that's what people believe in those moments. And now this is like Satanized, right? That this is, you know, the bad, a bad thing. And, and everybody had to suffer the consequences. So this guy made war against the government, against the establishment, against everybody. And, and a lot of, you know, he, he blew it out a plane. He put bombs of 100, 500 kilos of dynamite, dynamite in, in the streets. So it was a very hard moment. And 
And the only guys who in a moment decided to, you know, try to, not because they wanted, but bro, because now he decided that now he wants to fight with the Cali cartel. And so the only people who put, you know, the, their chest against the squad were the Cali cartel. And then the war started when everybody was afraid of this guy, my father and uncle and their associates were the only guy who had the courage to, you know, meet this guy in, in the level that he wanted to fight. Because when you start fighting with no master like this guy, you have to be a master. Because, you know, you're not gonna, you're gonna lose your life, you know, you have to change your values and, and fight. And, and he told my dad and uncle that he will kill him in five days and my father and uncle killed him in five years. So that's, that's a truth and I only don't say it. That's something that everybody knows that the Cali cartel was the main factor, not the DA, you know, the, the Cali cartel was the main factor to kill the squad. Because we're the guy who were putting the money and putting the information to break him down. All right, let's let's go over some of this a bit more slowly then. What was it like for your dad and Gilberto, his brother, who became the bosses? What was it like for them as kids growing up in Colombia? Very difficult, you know, because in, in Colombia, um, this is a country that has half, half of the of the population as is is, is uh, you know in 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 absolute poverty, how do you say poverty? Poverty. Yeah. Uh, so it's complicated, you know, to, to, you know, be able to go up in the scale, you have to be or a famous singer or a family soccer player or a politician or, or you, you are born in, uh, you know, a, a cradle of gold. That's, that's, that's the only way you can go up. So, in those moments, you know, it was very hard for them. My, my uncle was the guy who started everything. You know, he decided to throw out his dad like in, when he was 16 years old, I believe. And he decided to throw out his dad because he didn't provide for his family. And he took the, the responsibility of the family and he worked. He, he worked. And then he was a, he was a very greedy and ambitious man and then he decided to get involved in a lot of criminal activities and and my father was different because my father you know my, my, my uncle wanted him to be a, a lawyer a famous law uh, person and and my father started studying and my uncle was sacrificing himself so his brother could be you know a famous attorney but in the end this thing gets you involved because you know sometimes my uncle needed some help from my dad and then my my dad got involved and then but in the and in, in the start my uncle was the the main guy you know until he was the guy who who initially this this crime organization with chepe santa cruz in 80 in 73 and they were putting cocaine in in new york and controlling the market from 73 to like 80, you know, there, there was like uh, the main, you know, cocaine uh, bomb boom in, in, in New York. And they were the guys who were involved in that. And, and then a lot of stuff happened over here in the United States. Uh, you know, the authorities started like put more attention into cocaine because in the start in the 70s, they were more, you know, in in in, in the mafia Italian with the heroin, heroin. So in 90 and 80, they had a lot of problems here. They almost captured my uh, chepe, they almost captured my uncle over here. And, and then, you know, they go back to Colombia, they, they continue. Then Escobar decided to kill the mystery of justice, and then everything blew up. Then my uncle did decided to go and hide in Spain and then he's captured in Spain. And then that's when, when my father became number one and was the guy who brought the cartel from here to the top where they, because you know, he, 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 he got a lot of power because of this fight that he had with the American legal fight that he had with the Americans. He had to corrupt a lot of uh, politicians, important people in Colombia. And then he became, I believe one of the most powerful men 
in in that in that in that area. No, my father was never the man who more money had in the drug business, but he, he was the man who he was a guy who had more power. You know, that's that's, inter that's interesting. You said that uh, Gilberto was involved in all kinds of criminal activity before the drug trafficking. What criminal activity was he involved in? He was a uh, he. He was robbing. You know, he was. They, they were. That's called like in Colombia, pilateria terrestre. It's like being a, a, a road pirate. He was robbing. You know, different merchandise. Um, uh, robbing, stopping in in different trucks and selling them. And then he he became involved in activities of kidnapping. And a lot of stuff, you know, uh, micro traffic. And then, and then in 73, he decided to bring in the two first kilos to, to the States. And then he became, you know, uh, one of the most important drug traffickers in, in the world. So you said that your father was more studious then, you know, he had a law career planned out. What was, if, if his brother was getting criminal, into criminal activity, did that cause problems between the brothers i mean what was their relationship like back then no no the, the, I, I never saw uh our relationship to two brothers like they had no they were i never saw my dad and uncle fight i never saw a discussion maybe they had it in private but i never saw that they were one one respected him like his father and the other one respected him like the guy who saved him from the americans in 84 you know the guy who robbed them because my, my uncle should be started uh, being brought to the United States in 84 from Spain. But my father, you know, did everything and, and, and was able to bring his brother back to Colombia and save them no, from in those days from, from being in American jail. So I believe there was a, an amazing relationship. I never saw one like that. And, and it's admirable, you no? Know, that two brothers can love us all so much and help them, and help them help help them but they and they you know be very close and be very you know be able to to you know fight the ego no because sometimes it's it's hard to fight the ego when you're running uh in uh, a top criminal organization the four bosses of the cali cartel was your father his brother gilberto chepe and pacho who joined next? Was it Chepe? No, no. The, the organization started my uncle and Chepe. Then my father came in and Pacho. And Pacho came in like in 84, 80, 85, when my father was in charge. He was he was the main guy who was receiving the cocaine to, for my dad and he was selling in New York. So they began very close. So that's why he, he became a member like in 85, 86. So you but saying, the, the original three guys are Gilberto, Chepe, and Miguel. So are you saying that Chepe then came in before your father? In that case, was, was Chepe, was he a crime partner for Gilberto before the drug trafficking? Is that how they knew each other? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were, they were, they were the associates from, uh, from, you know, like seven, the 70s, you know, they were very close. So Narcos shows Chepe as this larger than life character, you know, very brave action. There's always action around him. W what was he like in real life? He was a joker, you know, he was always making fun. He was, you know, he was a very dangerous man, but he was always a good character. And I, I, I know him when uh, I'm 12 years old, you know, because he's in the, in the, in the parties of my family. And I always, liked him, you know, because he was a very likable guy, you know? but he was very dangerous, but he was a, a very jokeful guy. He was, you know, always uh, making fun of you, always laughing. He was, he was, he was a very uh, likable guy. <laughs> so did Gilberto and Chepe, did they have their own crew doing these robberies? Did they have a lot of guys with them before no, the trafficking? No, they, they were together and they had a, a band, you know, they were a crew. And they were part of the crew. And then Pacho, what was he like in real life? I, I didn't have a lot of con contact with that guy. I saw him like five or six times in my life. You know, he was like most, you know, very quiet guy. Very, very, you know. And my father didn't like us 
to be around him. What year were you born? I was born in 1965. So what's your first memories? My first memory, no, not, not very good memories because, you know, I had a very difficult childhood because I, my, that relationship between my father and my mother was never good. My mother was a very difficult person and my father was a bohemian guy. He wanted to, you know, be a party all the time. So it was very difficult relationship. It was not a close one. Uh, and when I was five years, I almost died because they had to, you know, take uh, one of my kidneys. And so, you know, it was uh, my childhood not, was not very good. Then my mother makes a radical decision and decides to bring me to the United States and, and leave, leave my father. She almost kidnapped me, you know. She brought me here without my father. I, I, never, I didn't saw my father for five, six years. And it was hard, no? And then I, we came, we, go, we went back to Cali and then I looked for my father and then I decided not to live with her or even him. I decided to go and live with Gilberto's wife. And, and I believe that was like the best, you know, time that I had because really like from 79 to 84, 85, when things were like, no, 84 were, you know, normal we live a normal life it was like the best memories that i have no that because it was normal we were normal kids you know studying playing soccer and but then came this situation and gilberto and that changed our lives so when you left for america how old were you like six and when you came back how old were you 11 like 11. and did you notice the difference in the standard of living because the drug money was coming in then when you sure, came back? Sure. My, father, my, my father in those moments, you know, was, wow. Well, he was, you know, like I say, the night and the day he was a, a, a very successful businessman because he had uh, three or four different companies, big companies. He had a soccer team, you know, he was very, you know, known for everybody. He was famous in the city. But in the night, he was one of the one of the drug lords of the world. You know, that was the, they they did a lower life. You know, in those moments, and they knew how to run themselves. They knew how to you know people didn't talk. You know, I found out they were involved in this activity of drug trafficking when in '84 when Gilberto is captured in Spain. You know, we had like some some rumors, but in the end, you know, it was a normal life and it was a good life for us. And so. You, you're not asking questions, you're, you know, because you live good, you only have to study to get benefits. So that's, for us, it was normal. And, and my father and uncle in those days, if you see him, they were only running around with one or two guys. All right, William. So from what you just said then, you were about 19 years old when you realized what um, occupied. I'm like 18 years old. 18. And just to give the backstory for that then, so the highest level official ever to be assassinated in those years was the Minister of Justice, Lara Bonilla, by Escobar, which caused many cartel leaders to flee Colombia. Now, before we get to the story of your father going to Spain and, and his brother going to Spain, what, you know, did Pablo Escobar consult the Cali bosses? Did he let them know he was going to assassinate Lara Bonilla? No, no. In those moments, we didn't, they didn't know nothing about that. And then when that happened, uh, everybody had to, you know, uh, like you flew or fly away. And I believe my uncle made a mistake. He should have stayed in Colombia because in the end, they were, they were going to go against Medellin, the government. But he decided to, to, to go to Spain. And I believe that was one of his great mistakes, you know, because when he was captured over there, Everybody knew really who Gilberto Rodriguez was, even us, you know, as a family. He's one of the biggest drug lords in the world, you know, because nobody knew. Everybody was talking about Escobar. And, and, and no, Escobar didn't ask nobody when he did something. He, he did it then. Then, then he brought us to, to meetings when, when my father was involved and tell him that he wanted to do that. And then my father... 
tell them that that it was a decision that they were not gonna we were not gonna get involved in that that our fight was a legal fight and but i believe that was like the he's you know that started like break up the relationship because we didn't follow him hey so if you join this podcast william's book is available worldwide son of the cali cartel it is mind-blowing it's on amazon as an ebook audio book and the paperback and you saw the Cali cartel as represented in Narcos. A lot of that was BS. William lays it down. What really happened? His dad was one of the leaders of the biggest coke cartel in the world at that time. And when his dad went to prison, William was running it. And it starts out with the assassination attempt on William, where he gets shot up and his friends die. So again, check out William's book, Son of the Cali Cartel. Links will be in the description box below this video on the YouTube version. Cheers. And in the end, he was going to find something to go against us, you know, because uh, this is the way he he saw it. He, was, he, he believed he was invincible and he can fight. You cannot fight a war against everybody at the same time because in the end, you're going to lose. So that's, that's what happened to Pablo, no? Yeah, he fought, yeah. he was fighting with like, with five or, or six organizations, the government, the guerrillas, the, the Cali cartel, the, the other people, the, those around him. So in the end, you have to lose when you, you lose your, I believe he lost his head. What's interesting then is that Pablo Escobar's business partners were the Ochoa brothers. And when your, your you guys' bosses went to Spain, didn't they go with the Ochoa's brothers? Wasn't Jorge, we wanna, we, Jorge Ochoa? We wanna, we wanna the Ochoa's brother, Jorge Luis, you know, because my uncle knew him from, my uncle was a friend of Jorge Luis because they were involved in, in a bank in Panama in, in, the, in the 80s. And so he knew them then, he met over there at Jorge Luis in, in Spain and then they got caught. Okay, so now they've been caught and they're facing extradition to America. So what legal strategy was employed so that they wouldn't be extradited to America? Uh, my father decided to, uh, you know, uh, take the same crime that my uncle did in, in the United States. And he opened a, 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 the, same, uh, the same case in, in Colombia. So, you know, because the, the crime is started in Colombia and finished in the United States. So that's what he did. So the United States was asking him for, for this. And then my father made up this other case. And this judge was asking for my, my, my uncle in, in his tradition from Colombia. So that was the strategy that, that he started. But it was a, it was a very crazy and, and hard hard you know uh, process a lot of money was spent to try to to save my uncle and, and a lot of corruption was done in in spain in colombia to achieve this, this goal so this case that was made up then did it involve bull smuggling Drug, no no it was jorge luis that jorge luis ochoa that was what he did it was different strategies no our, our strategy was the same crime that my uncle was charged in, in the United States for bringing cocaine over here was open in Colombia. It was about cocaine. Jorge Luis was about boot fighters. Fighting. I see. Okay, yeah. So he, he managed to get um, sent back to America as well. So are you saying then that money ended up with the judges in Spain to make that happen? Not only not the judges, but a lot of people with a lot of influence in in that country. You know, the uh, they they were the guys who got the money and and helped my father achieve the, this this hard and difficult fight, win this this battle. No, because in the end it was a battle that we won. All right, so you're 18. You find this out. What goes through your head? Oh, it was crazy. It blew up our, our, not only uh, mine, my, 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 my other, I believe some of my cousin knew, but my, the one who was almost the same age of mine, we didn't know. So it was very hard for us. Uh, 
we, you know, felt betrayed because in the end was, you know, everybody was now putting the finger in us. That's why we believe, no, because, you know, you start like making up, everybody's looking at us. But in the end, it was our family. It was our uncle. We loved him. And they were good with us. We had a good life. You know, we, we had everything we wanted. It. We study and, and be, you know, that, that was like our part of the bargain of we had to, to, you know, bring, because it was like a, a contract we had with, with my uncle. This we, we, is that if we achieve and be good students and achieve our goals, we will get, get you know, uh, it seems uh, and it changed, you know, we, that's that's like what they he taught us, no? That everything we have to win it, and that I believe it was a very good way to to the, the way he you know broke us up because in the end that they make us people responsible people, no? And and what I tell you, so in the end we you know we decided to be loyal to you know sit, sit beside them and 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 try to be loyal and accomplish uh, go to Spain spend time with my uncle. When he came back to Colombia, every, every Saturday, we have to be uh, in the jail, you know, from eight o'clock to of the morning to four o'clock uh, of the afternoon, you know, trying to be with him and, and being loyal to our, our family, you know? And in and, and those moments, you know, I saw that relationship with my father and uncle and my father was a lawyer. So that's when I decided to be a lawyer. What was it like visiting him in Spain? You know, it was difficult because the, the jails in, in Spain are hard, like here, like in the United States. I, I believe in the United Kingdom must be the same, you know. Um, I never was in a, in a jail before, but it was, you know, it was a, a mirror here. And we have to talk about, you know, pressing a button. It was very hard you know, to see him that way. But, but, but in the end, uh, in the end, it was, you know, the faith that he, that, that he, you know, brought up to him. Was he confident about his case or was he worried? No, very worried, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, a, I believe it was 70, 30, you know, the United States will get him, but, you know, my father never, never surrendered and he achieved that. So when your father got back, did he have to go in the prison in Colombia for a period of time? Yeah, when no, but yeah, when my uncle comes back and like my uncle goes back like back like in eighty five something like that, and and he has to stay like two years in prison to ninety seven, to eighty seven. Sorry, so eighty seven from eighty five to eighty seven in jail, and then in eighty seven he he was released. Okay, and what was your father doing during that time? He was managing the Cali cartel and you know. And, and part of the legal business, no? But the, my uncle, yeah, the, my uncle was like the guy who, who was more involved in, in running the legal business. He, he was, you know, and now he's in Colombia. So now he's running the legal business. My father is running the other, the other business, the legal one. And what was the Cali cartel's relationship with the government like during those years? Good, because, you know, we were spending a lot of money, you know, bribing them. And, and being close to them, we were, you know, allies and in those moments because they help us, you know, achieve the, this goal of bringing my uncle back from Spain. How did things deteriorate with Pablo Escobar and you guys? They happened, uh, something happened in New York. Two employees, one from Pacho Herrera and one from him, got involved in a conflict. I, was, I believe it was for a girl or something like that. And then I believe Pacho's guy killed this guy. And then I, Pablo asked for the head of this man. And, my, and then Pacho didn't want to surrender him. And then now Escobar not only wants the guy, he wants Pacho too. And then my father and uncle said, we don't surrender our friends. If you want to fight, we can fight. And then they found out that he was going for all of for them. So that's when the war started. What about Virginia Vallejo? Was she sleeping with Escobar and sleeping with Gilberto? For people who don't know who she is, she's a very famous uh, TV presenter. That's what they say. I don't know. I cannot say yes or no, but that's what people say. <laughs> okay. 
So as things deteriorated with Escobar, then how did your life change? We changed uh, radical, man, because we you know and I only was, you know, we, we, we were running around with one guy and then I have like four guys behind me. I have four, five or four guys, bodyguards, all my family now. Now we, we used to have like two, three guys in our security. Now we have like a hundred and then change, life changed forever, you know, because now we have this guy in top of us and we have this awful world, you know, with people with guns around us. And, but that's the only way we can survive. What were the first attacks Escobar launched against Cali? Uh, he started burning our, our drug stores, our pharmacies, and they, he started burning them in, in Medellin and, 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 and trying to get to my father and uncle. No? There were a lot of people coming and going from Medellin to Cali trying to, to assassinate my father and uncle. And then they're saying, no, they were sending people to Medellin to, to try to hit this co-op. There's still a lot of noise, uh, William, from the from the table. Is there like something on the table that's making the noise? Let me take it out. Now mm -hmm. it's better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the war's heating up with Cali and Escobar, and the government now are they coming after Escobar only, and are you guys, you know, joining with the government against Escobar? And first it was that way, no? And first it was only the government uh, against the squad and we helping the government. And in 89, this guy in El Mexicano, Gacha, decided to kill uh, Galam, one of the, one of our president, you know, candidates from Colombia. And then uh, another, you know, um, big wave came against drug trafficking yeah against the government and then then i believe that saved my my uncle and, la, and father's life because they had to hide themselves they were not going they were not you know looking so hard for them but they had to you know not be in their houses you know they had to be mobile and then i believe that that saved them their life because my father was always in the same place and his core was you know in the end he was going to get to him so that's, unfortunately, it's a very sad part of the story of our country, but in the end, I believe it saved my, my father's uncle's life. Do you know how the assassination of Galam was organized by Gacha? Mm, they, they, brought, they say they, brought, uh, they bribed one of his close bodyguards and he knew where he's going to be there. But I believe he's suiciding so because he knew he, they, he, they were going to kill him. And then he went, he, he still went to that, that. That part of the country was the, the domain of Gacha and he shouldn't have been there. So, you know, and, 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 and they, they killed him. You know? So do you think he was partially responsible for his own death then because he no, knew the No, risk? no, no, no. It's because, because it's, it's crazy to say that because, you know, he shouldn't be... You know, he should have been able to to go anywhere he wanted, but in the end, it was a very diff difficult zone. Uh, uh, it was very, you know, very brave. I don't know. And he trying to go there, but in the end, it was one of his a great mistake because he was killed. Okay, so in the West, some key figures in the story are often left out, and people are not f very familiar with the Castaño brothers. Could you explain to people who they were? They were like a faction of the right wing. Uh, they were uh, fighting a war against the guerrillas, the left wing. And the Castaños became paramilitaries in like in the 80s because... We got, we got, uh, the, the, we got the noise again, really. The, uh, the, um, the FARC killed their father and then they become involved and they become one of the high groups of right, right wing and, 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 right, and fought a, a, a war against uh, uh, the guerrillas. Okay, and in the beginning, they had a good relationship with pa Pablo Escobar, didn't they? Yeah, they were, they were working with him and they were against us. Uh, but in the end, they find out that they and he was going to kill them, and 
and they, you know, came, came over here to, to the side of my father and uncle. And then there were the guys who helped with my father and uncle putting the money, build the Pepes. The Pepes were the guys who, in the end, uh, finished off Escobar's organization. Okay, so do you believe then that Pablo Escobar starting to kill his business associates was the beginning of the end for him because he killed other yeah, people yeah. before the, the the castaños realized yeah because the guy you know he, he he at the end he made so so much cows in in colombia he killed so many people he blew up our airplane and then he got what he wanted you know he got a prison that he built and he was saved there it was very difficult to get to him because he was, you know, protective with police and the in the in the army, in the government. So I believe he lost it killing those those two men, those two two best partners. You know, those guys were uh, very high objects for my father and uncle in the war against him because all the guys were giving the money to fight the war against us. And I don't know, these guys lost it. He decided to kill them because the, those guys were just bored, not to giving all their money to this guy to fight wars against everybody and then I, be, I believe that was one of one of the most important mistake the squad the second most important mistake the squad made you know because in the, that moment he lost the war you know why because people who know who knew his organization you know they were you know sometimes working together decided to come over here so now we know how he operates who the guys are and and it was easy to you know finish them off so you're talking about the assassination of the moncado and galliano factions at the yeah. cathedral, at the cathedral and uh -huh. these are these are people that he was really close to and R roberto were, I, I, tell you, I, I believe in the list there were three or four in the list of my uncle and dad you know to 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 hit because we're the guys who put in the money to fight the war against us you know so I believe it was one of the greatest mistakes because the people who were around the Moncas and Galeano came over here to Cali to ask for protection. And now we know how he operated, who were the close person he had, how they, where they hide. And so it was easy to finish him off. And one of those people was Don Berna. Who was Don Berna, if you could tell the people? Don Berna was one of the Moncada's main guys and, and the guy, or Galeanos. I don't know what, which of the, the two fractions. I believe it was more with the Galeanos. And then he became, you know, one of the main guys for us to be involved in the persecution in Escobar. And he was infiltrated in the, in, uh, in the group of the police that was against Escobar, the Grupo de Busca. And, and he he was operating with them, with the with the with the police group, you know, against Escobar and did a lot of, and he was the day he, they killed Escobar in the operation. Yeah, so I've read Don Berner's book, Killing the Boss, and he describes going out to Cali to meet the Cali guys for the first time. He you know he was apprehensive. Uh, to join to make this alliance do you remember did you ever meet Don Berna do you remember any of that I would I met Don Berna but after that you know I'm, I met I met Don Berna in 96 before my my hit I, in a meeting that I was with, with the Castaño when they kill when they kill Chepe I, I had to go and had a meeting with them and I saw Don Berna two times in my life that day and another day like in two, two or oh one, something like that. That's that's. The, but the first time I saw Brenda was the day that I had that meeting with this, with the Cali car, the North Valley cartel leaders in 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 the in, in the in the right wing is uh, Castaños faction in in Monteria. I had that meeting. Okay, could you describe who Los Pepe's were and how, how they started? Los Pepe were perseguidos for, you know, persecuted for Pablo Escobar. Those guys were the were the partners of the, the Boncada and the Galeano and in in some paramilitaries like like the Castaño brothers or there there was that group that was formed to anacil any how do you say the word? 
Ana Kile, eh, to, bueno, to kill, to destroy Escobar. Um, and it was all these, these people were financed by my father and uncle in the Cali cartel. Yeah, because the US tries to, you know, if, if people go back and read books like Killing Escobar, US Special Forces, the DEA, the CIA, you know, they're all trying to take credit for it. But actually, it was financed by the Cali cartel. On the ground, you've got the Castaño brothers, you've got Don Berner, you've got Los Pepes. And, but they were working in collaboration with the police, weren't they? Because they had the equipment, yeah, let, let, the equipment to say, track him. Yeah, they say, you know, I think DA, DA was, was more important in, in the falling of the Cali cartel than in, in the managing falling. Because the DA was giving information, it was giving some equipment so, to authorities to, to find this guy, right? And I believe, like, let's say the American authorities had 20% uh, of, you know, of Escobar, destroying Escobar. I believe the government, Colombia government, had another 20% in the, the Cali cartel and the Pepe, so those guys, like 60% of destroying Escobar. That's, that's the truth of, of, of the story. It's not only I say it, a lot of people have said it. And, and that's, 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 that's the real story, right? Because that's how Americans work. They, they, they don't care. They hook up with somebody to destroy the organization. Then they go for you. And then when they, they're with you, they're, they're trying to, with this other organization, you know, try to make alliance to destroy you. And that's, that's the way American destroy, you know, uh, all these organizations. So how did you hear about Escobar's death? Excuse me? I didn't hear you. When, when did you hear that Pablo Escobar was dead? I was, I was in a meeting uh, of, of my firm of lawyers. We were talking about some problems, legal problems that we had to resolve. And then somebody called me and told me that the squad was, was dead. And immediately I called my father and, and he confirmed that there was Gore. Okay, so in Don Berner's book, Killing the Boss, he claims that he, Don Berner, and his cousin, Seed, were in the house assassinating Escobar before the police, you know, before the media, and, and they were told to leave. Do you think that Don Berner was telling the truth? Part of the truth, I believe, as a, the, the hidden score was a combination in, in, in the paramilitaries. That, that's true. Uh, his cousin was there, but two or three uh, policemen were involved too in the shooting at Escobar. And so then when, when this guy, the, the half of, the, of the, this group came, he told Don Bernard to leave, but the the operation was was a combi combi combination of between police and the Pepe's who, who killed this squad. Okay, and then when the government, the president, he said these are the men who killed Escobar, and he told them the media, you know, these policemen, but but Pepe's had to disappear, did they? Because they were an illegal death squad. Yeah, sure. But no, nobody wanted to, you know, the government was not going to say that the, the papers in the Cali cartel has killed his squad. <laughs> no, it was uh, a, a triumph of uh, a uh, 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 win of the government and the, uh, and the establishment. But, but in the end, it was a combination you know, of uh, all this thing because the, the squad was not only dead that day, it was, it was a war, it was fought. And uh, all, all in five years, and it was you know it, we were destroying him little by little because it was a, a very difficult man. It was a very, very dangerous person and a very, a very you know very intelligent man. So it was not easy. Uh, it was it was a process. It was a process that was very that was was a lot of money spent and a lot of blood. You know, what so was. It was you know, what what was the atmosphere like in Cali when Escobar died? Did you guys feel safe? 
Yeah, it was it was like you know we had like it was like two feelings like yeah we were safe uh, what's gonna happen I believe it was the the most important moment of my father he had to 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 resolve a lot of issues of his life but I, I believe in those moment you know pride and you know the ego everything came forward because he believed he was invincible and then that's, that's the day when he lost because he, he, he should have you know tried to surrender himself like the Ochoa brothers did and resolve all these issues with the authorities but you know he was Mr. Miguel Rodriguez he was the number one man in the in the world and and he believed he could achieve anything but I believe uh, the Americans and in, in the in the families who are the who control Colombia gave them a little bit for a little while the power and now they wanted to take it back. So that's 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 the story. You know, you have you have to read in my book how how all of these things happen and and how really was this cowardly story, you know. All right, so when Escobar was assassinated then, what was the atmosphere for Cali? Did you guys feel a lot safer at that point? Yeah, like for our lives, we feel a lot of safer because those guys were now the, the new, you know, drug bosses of, the, of Colombia and everybody respected us in those days. Um, but in the end, it was a very, you know, difficult situation because I believe my father and Uncle Blue the most important opportunity they have to, you know, like, you know, resolving all those those legal issues that we had. But I believe they lost them, no? Because they had won a battle against the Americans. And now they they brought down Escobar. So I, they believe they were invincible. And 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 I believe they they messed it up because they they had that this great opportunity and they lost it. Okay. And do you think that your father then he believed that because he'd been instrumental in taking Escobar down, that the Colombian government would prevent his extradition to America? Yeah, he believed that. No, he believed that he had so many relationships with all those politics politicians, and they he had a uh, you know. Uh, he believed that he has the structure to, you know, be able to not be sent to to United States. And in those moments, it was it was easy to think that because, you know, the extradition didn't exist between the United States and Colombia. So he, he believed he was safe, but America was working, you know, he was working. And and in the end, they were going to try to put in place the extradition again. So imagine at that point in time, then you guys must have been heroes in the eyes of the government because they had struggled against Escobar for so long. Yeah, but you know this, this, this is this is momentary, you know, because you had, you know, in those moments, my father had uh, all the police by his side, a lot of people, politicians, uh, high profile uh, people from the government. But in the end, uh, the government was. The government was finishing uh, his period. Was another another you know government was come was gonna come in place, and then everything was gonna go change. And and the United States decided you know to to pressure Colombian authorities, so they wanted to change the police you know who ran the, the police in those moments. And then they did it, and they put somebody that was in in, in their pocket, and, and then they he they, he came for us. Who was that? Uh, Rosso Jose Serrano. Okay. Known as one of the best policemen in the world. No, that's <laughs> that's ironic, you know. But but my father and uncle made him famous because they should have surrender and not let this guy, you know, say that that he finished the Cali cartel. How did the Ochoa brothers get through all this so safely? Because it seems like everybody else ended up dead or something really bad happened to them. Yeah, the only there were three brothers. One, one unfortunately got involved with some people who were, you know, drug trafficking. I, I don't believe he was doing it 
doing drug trafficking, but he was, you know, like lending money to those people and they, and he got hooked up in our operation in 2000 and he was sent to United States and he's doing 30 years. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. The other two... One died, you know, being a free man, and the other one is still there. I believe that they, they are really the, the, the guys who, who are the most intelligent drug lords because they were in the top, and now they live a normal life, no? Uh, because they knew how to lower their profile because they decided to forget about everything. But my father and uncle forgot about drug trafficking, but they didn't forget about power. You ever talk to the Ochoa brother who's alive? Is it? Okay? I only I only talk to to the guy who is over here, uh, Fabio, Fabio, because when I was fighting uh, one of those projects that the American were bringing up against us in in Congress, I met to him to ask him for some money to help us, and they, he he said he was gonna give like a hundred thousand dollars, and I said no no don't worry, thank you, but we believe. You know, they would they would understand that in the end, all all, all of the fractions are gonna suffer. You no, know? but in those moments, people believe that those laws only were for the Rodriguez. So, do you believe that the U.S. government will work with a cartel to destroy another cartel, and then they always need a boogeyman? Yeah, it's, that, history has shown that. No, it's not. I can say history has shown that, and if. If you see what happened in, in, in different parts of the world, that's, that's, that's the, the, the main uh, way that they did it. And not, not that they, they were associated with us, but they, you know, they, they look for uh, the other way for, for a moment for these people and make us grow. And, and then we, you know, destroy us. So I believe that that word was the most stupid thing that could happen because in the end, Pablo Squad is strong himself and we destroyed ourselves too. So the Castano brothers, who were instrumental in finding Escobar with Don Berner and, you know, the shootout and Don Berner saying he was there with his brother Seed, all that kind of stuff in the house. Those guys had to disappear because the media, you know, they, they couldn't be reported that the Colombian government was working with this death squad. But did the Castano brothers then turn against you guys because they were involved in the death of Chepe? Hey. The first person uh, of the uh, Castaño brother was Fidel, the, the, the oldest one. He was the, the guy who had honor and had work. The other one was a bandit, Carlos. And Carlos was a mercenary. So he, he was beside the guy who was giving money. We were not giving money anymore to him. And now the North Valley cartel was finding all his activities. So he decided to go with them and, and betray us. And he set Chepe up for death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. That's that's what happened. So when then, Chepe... later on, he was sending, you know, emissaries to my dad to say he was, you know, that he would have made a mistake. But but in the end, there was on that 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 was, you know, only trying to, you know, trying to, uh, trying to hide his chain. If Chepe, what he'd done. if Chepe came in second into the Cali cartel. So him and Gilberto must have been, you know, really close bonded for so many years. What effect did Chepe's death have on Gilberto and Miguel? Excuse me, I didn't understand the, the question. What, 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 did it break the hearts of your father and 
Gilberto. Yeah, yeah, Chepe. sure. My, my, my father and I, my father was most close to to Chepe. They were he, he loved him like a brother, and and but in the end, you know, my father, you know, felt like betrayed by him because he he didn't tell him that he was gonna uh, about, he was gonna you know uh, escape, and that was a very hard moment for my dad and uncle. They almost were estrated uh, by the government in those moments. Uh, and so it, it brought a lot of heat to us for what he did, but sure, it broke their hearts because they they loved him. But we couldn't show that because you know we, we couldn't show that we were you know heartbreaking because it would be you know very dangerous for us. So that was ninety six, was it when Chepe died? Ninety six, yeah, ninety six. And the assassination attempt on you was what year? Mine, the same year. Okay, so by ninety six then. The North Valley Cartel is that becoming the most yeah, powerful? They were, they, the, the most the powerful? That, 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 yeah, there was in the moment that they were more powerful, no? Because because they had they had they had the the, the paramilitaries guys, the the right wing with them, and they had the police that was run for a, a police that was their associate. that was called Danilo Gonzalez. That guy was the main guy. If you had a Danilo Gonzalez, you will win any war you want because he had the police by his side. So if you are a cocaine cartel in Colombia in those years and you've got the right wing killing communists on your side, does that mean you get protection from the government for, the, for that period no. of time? No, no, no. I don't believe that. I believe that, you know, that, uh, that I tell you, there's fr fractions that, that, that they're like, like waves, you know. First was Escobar here and then he fell and there's the Cali cartel up here. And then the Cali cartel falls, and now the North Valley cartel is here. Now they fall, and now another cartel comes because that's that's the way it works, no? And because we become objects of the authorities, and we, we become medals for police, police and the EA, you know those guys. So we're like we're we're we're, to, we're like how you say that? Pray? Uh, we're, we're like you know pray that 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 we're worth something when when we got a lot of value and. And that's what happened, you know. We we become more important, and now we're the object. So did Don so that, did Don Berner stay with you guys, or did he go with the Castaños? No, he went with the Castaños. Did he? Mm -hmm. So what happened to him? He was he went to prison. He's over here. He was what? excited. They 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 brought over here to the United States. Do you know what year? Do you know what year he went to prison? He went to prison like. Two, like two or six, two or eight, something like that. So, did he have a period of success then, while you guys were going down? Yeah, because you know, first, first was Escobar, then it was Los Rodriguez, then there was the North Valley Cartel, then it was a fresh one, a guy called Bale Varela. That guy was our enemy. They wasn't tough. Then there was one of these guys. Uh, main guys who killed Barrera uh, was Comba, and then came the paramilitary groups. So they, you know, they become number one object for the United oh. States. All right. So we're in 1996 now. You, there's been the assassination <laughs> attempt on you. Are you are you starting to think about the consequences of this now because you've seen it in real life? The the, the deaths you know, of your I, friends. I believe, I, I believe I started to see the consequences of my my life in when when I was hit, like my my attendant my life. I, I, that's when I changed the way I saw because uh, I was I was running stuff like two years and then I believe I was untouchable. I was to, to, uh, becoming my dad, and then you know when this happened, now I I knew that that in the end. I was gonna go to jail. I was gonna get killed. So, so uh, I really, you know, decided to to change this life and become different. No, but it was I was trapped because I was, you know, it's not an excuse. But in the end, uh, I had a lot of obligations with a family, you know, and I had to be loyal to to them. And how easy was that? I mean, you've just seen your friends get killed. I mean, your gut instinct would be to kill to tr to want to kill the people who killed your friends. Yeah, sure. It's, it's, that's the normal thing that you're gonna think about. But you, you have to uh, you have to know where you where, where where are you and who are your enemy and and you cannot be a kamikaze because you know you have a lot of family 
a lot of innocent people they're gonna get killed if you make a mistake so i learned you know to to live like the greek people they say you you, you should you know sit in the balcony of your house to see when when the the dead guy passes you know in 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 his box so that's 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 the way i learned to live and wait because i knew and i knew this type of guys they were very violent and they're gonna kill themselves between so that's what happened they all they all killed themselves uh, one against the other one because of power and ignorance had you learned lesson also from pablo escobar's son making the mistake when his dad died he did a radio interview and he said he was gonna be more tough than his father and he was going to kill the guys that killed his father but then he realized quite quickly that was a mistake had, had you been paying attention to that mm, yeah no but i believe he was a he was a little kid he was 14 years old you know and but it was a very dangerous uh, moment of his life because he was going to kill and and if you read the book of one of the books of him the guy who saved him it was my dad my dad, my dad didn't let him be killed you know and told him that i cannot protect you anymore go go and leave colombia and, but you, you cannot take you know the a little kid uh, well, he was hurt and but i believe he did the right thing leave be, leave colombia and become a, a a good person and because he's a good man i know him i have a relation with him and and i believe he he did the correct and people often ask, you know, where did Escobar's money go? Did a lot of the money have to be given to the Cali cartel because they took over? That's that's what you know. I, I believe one of the mistakes that maybe Juan Pablo says is that because a lot of people got the, their money, but the Cali cartel didn't get. My father and uncle only got a building that was not even his. It was the the Galeanos building in, in Medellin. The other, the other things as for were, 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 you know, given, uh, given to, to the Pepe's, you know, that's, that's what happened because there a lot, and, and most, of, a lot of those, those, you know, uh, properties were taken by Escobar to other people. So you're saying the Castaño brothers got a lot of Escobar's wealth? Yeah, yeah, Escobar, uh, Don Berna, all those people got a lot of stuff. I, we only got a building. In Medellin, the the even it was even Pablo Escobar. It was the Galeanos building. It was a very expensive, expensive building in in in, in Medellin. That's the only thing we got from okay. that war. Okay, so you say you were trapped. Then you wanted, you know, to somehow stop it because you saw the consequences. But it's like you're you're at a it's it's so big. It's like you're at a ship. You're captain of a ship at sea. You can't turn the ship that easily, can you? Is no, this is you know what, what happened with me, and my channel, and my friend. Uh, I got the plane when the plane was going down, and and one of the one of the engines was in in flames. So that's 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 what I have to manage, you know. In those moments, a lot of you know, it was a very difficult situation. My father and uncle were in jail. We're not we we're not getting the cash that we used to manage, and we had a lot of people against us and fighting against the American, fighting against the establishment. It was very difficult moments, no? And that's what I had to live. But I, I tried to do my best because I was a loyal soldier for my dad and uncle. And, but in the end, we were gonna lose the war because, because you to the Americans, you win battles, but the war in the end, you're gonna lose if you don't bargain with them. So the Cali cartel was famous then for having hiding places in walls. And sometimes, you know, when the police would come, your dad or Gilberto would hide in the walls. Is it, is it Cayeta? Is that, is that what it's called? Caletas. Caletas. Could you, you, could... you, you, might, you manage my friend. That's, 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 that's the sad part of this, no? You're the most powerful man in, in, in Colombia and you have to hide in a Caleta in a wall. To survive so that that's the life you want in the end that's what you have to to think no it's it's worth it that being the most powerful man and you have to get in a wall to survive that's is that the life that the people wanted that's 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 what you want to be that's that's what people have to think about it 
Did you ever have to hide in a Caletta? No, never, never. Unfortunately, when I was, you know, hiding for four, more than four, year, four years, I decided to leave Cali and, and go to the countryside and to the jungle and hide there. It was easier. And, and I ran with two or three people by my side. That, that, was, that was easier. And I had a lot of luck. God was with me and, and I was a very disciplined person. You know, I, I, was, I was hiding, really, I was hiding. I was not fooling around. I was 24 seven trying to not get ca cut. So there was a guy on the inside who was high up in your security, Jorge Salcido? Jorge Salcedo. What, what did he do? He, the only important thing that guy did in his life was give up my father, no? And 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 he made a book, and now he's like James Bond, no? But <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was, he made a lot of stories, but everybody believed him. But in the end, the only important thing that he did, and it was very important because he he was the guy who gave up my father, the main guy of the Cali cartel, and that's Jorge Salcedo. And he was your father's, was he his, his head security? No. He, he was the guy who was running communications in the Cali cartel. You know, when, when the war started, uh, the, the, the chief of security of my dad bring him aboard. And, and this guy was the guy who was running that part of the operation, the communication, you know. And the guy was the guy who was, you know, they had a big, a big computer and they were taking the incoming calls from Medellin in Colombia and mixing it up in Cali and see if this guy, you know, a uh, 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 suspicious number that we have from Medellin calls that house, then this guy is, is now an object. And so they start following the guy and then they take him uh, to see what they're doing. That was the, the main, you know, a operation that Jorge Sassel was doing. Uh, and then when, when, when the war was won and everything happened, then this guy, you know, because he was, you know, he was an intelligent man, we, we, you have to say it. Uh, he, he started, you know, taking down like people close to my dad to get near him. And then he, he, he surrendered this person that was called El Mayor del Basto. He, he was the main security man of my father, he, he surrendered, his, he gave him up to the authorities and then now he became like very close to my dad and that's the way he started, you know, uh, telling where my dad was. How were you captured? I, ne I never was captured, my friend, I surrendered myself. I surrendered myself in Panama uh, and was brought over here to the United States, but uh, I was not captured, I surrendered myself. What led to you surrendering yourself? I believe my two kids and my wife. Uh, I, I believe I, I had run more than four years. Mm. And my father was already over here. And when I saw my father get on the plane, I knew he, he lost his war against the Americans. And then it was my turn to, to try to resolve my problem. No? And, and unfortunately, I did. And I give my kids an opportunity to live a different life. Like being in Colombia, they will never be who they are here, you know, they, because they always will be. That's, that's William's kid. This, this, is, this, this is the granddaughter of Miguel Rodriguez. So I believe here there are normal people and, and they're doing ama amazing. How much prison time did you serve? I did five years. Uh, was that in the federal, U.S. federal system? A federal, a federal institution, yeah. Okay. Uh, what year were you released? 210. 210. Okay. And what was it like coming out? Difficult, no? Adapting yourself to, uh, you know, I, I was lost in space, I say, because it's, <laughs> it's not only the, the, the five years that I was running, if I was in prison, there were four more years running. They were more difficult than being in prison. They were, we're talking about nine years when you're are totally, you know, out there. I lost uh, communicate, uh, you know, how you say that with computers and all that. 
technology. There, there, there's something there's something very very mm. funny, you know. When when I got out in two two or ten, I got in a a, a friend's car, you no, know, a, a BMW, and the guy told me, "Hey, why don't you you drive?" So I got in the car and. My God, and where's the key? <laughs> you know, it's the, it's all, I say, no, it's at that button. <laughs> so I, you know, I was I was lost in technology for a long time because it was ten, ten almost ten years of you know being hiding and being in prison. It's, it's it's not easy, but I believe like in six months you adapt yourself to a normal life. But because at first, you know. And the noise, a lot of people, that, that was like very stressful for me. But but in the end, you adapt yourself. And unfortunately, I knew I had to adapt myself to my home because in the end, I was the stranger now. You know, my two kids and my wife been by themselves for nine years. So unfortunately, she she waited for me and, and she gave the principles to my kids. And, and I will never have... Uh, I don't believe nothing to pay her, no, all, all that she done for my two kids and for me. Oh, that's good to hear, man. So are you able to visit your father? Or is that not allowed? I see him like three times uh, when I came out, you know, but now for COVID, COVID is very difficult, that situation. At first was difficult too. And well, let's see. Let's see what happened with this COVID thing because 12 prisons are still, you know, by those rest restrictions. And your uncle, you know, he'd served a lot of prison time. Was his death a surprise, Gilberto? No, he was sick. No, he was sick uh, a long time. And, and in the end, it was very sad, no, that, that, that he died in a prison cell. And that's, that's, but in the end, that's, that's, that's the shoes that you make you know, in life. You know, uh, I always say that when you decide this type of life, you, you have glory and you have, you have the boom, but then you have the fall and in the end. You will end that, or you land in, or you die in a prison. So, unfortunately, my uncle uh, died there, uh, and it's very sad. Does your dad have a release date? Yeah, he'll be out in, I believe, March of the 30 to 30. In 2030. Mm -hmm. 2030. 2030. So, he's got eight more years. Yes. No, no, seven years to go. Oh, seven, seven more years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how does he pass the time in prison? Does he have a routine that, that he told you about? The only the only way you have to survive in prison, you have to do a routine. No, you you have to do a lot of exercise, read, and you know that's 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 the only way you you can pass the days. No, and so that's he has a routine. He works a lot now, but now it's complicated with the COVID thing. They almost they don't let him go out to the yard. It's 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 hard. No, this it's being in prison in prison. It's, it's, it's not easy. So when I interviewed Pablo Escobar's son, he said he gets messages every day from people who've watched Narcos and they say, I want to be like your dad. And he says, no, you don't want to be like my dad. What do you say to these young men who think it's cool to be a gangster? Well, it's, I'm going to tell them the, the, the truth. No, not, not, I'm not going to try to sell them a story that not is that the, the one that Netflix and those platforms sell to those guys, those kids that this is, this is a glamour. This is amazing. The, the, this is the life that, that you should respect. I believe not because I, I didn't learn this by reading a book. This, this was not a story that somebody told me I live, I lived there. No. And and, 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 and I believe it was a very hard life that I have to, you know, suffer for my bad actions i've been i was shot eight times i was running for four i was in prison five years now i'm i'm an asylum i just said auxilium asylum i don't know how you auxilium auxiliado asylum. i don't know asylum asylum from my country i cannot go back so you know i have lost a lot of people that i care uh, my 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 best friends that died my cousin that i love died uh, i have lost a lot of relations with a lot of family members and so that's 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 the real story no and 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 that's not cool you know it's i'm not i'm not gonna say that, that you're not gonna get the the boom that's this this I, I, I have to tell them that the truth yeah i was i was a man uh the main one of the main guys of this organization but in the end for 20 seconds of 
being the man has been 30 years of being, you know, and suffering the bad consequences of my, my bad actions. Yeah, that, that's a, a good message for the young people. And this has been such a powerful interview. I mean, there's, we could probably do parts two and parts three because there's so much more to get into. I know you've been very generous with your time right now. So I'm, I'm going to urge the viewers to, you know, get your book. There's so much more in the book. Son of the Cali Cartel. It's available worldwide on Amazon as an ebook, as a paperback, as an audio book. And it's just breathtaking. You know, it starts out with what happened with the assassination and just then gets into all the details of the cartel. But, you know, if, if we did do another part, I'd be fascinated to hear about, your, you know, your prison stories, the five years in prison. Yeah, what what that went you went through the on the run for four years, the, the challenges there. There's just there's just so much more to it, William. Yeah, it's the, I believe the the book uh, it starts the story of and when I surrender myself and you know do my time in and not not in prison. It's not like the the part when I you know my legal battle is in there, I believe. And but like you say, there are a lot more stories. You know, being in a jail is. It's very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, another adventure. So, so yeah, later on we can make another one and talk about that. Maybe talk about soccer, talk a lot of stuff <laughs> that are that's not that's missing. Can people contact you or follow you on social media? Yeah, my my Instagram is William Rodriguez A A B, and that's that's the main the main uh, social media that I have and. I, I hope you follow me there and, and to see what I'm doing. So all those links will be in the description box. And a huge thank you to Reese Dry as well. He is managing William and Reese's links will be in the description box. So if you want to organize something with William, if you want to interview William or you, you want to do an event, whatever it is, go down in the description box and please contact Reese Dry. So thanks for watching this interview. Let us know in the comments what you thought. Really appreciate it. Take care wherever you are in the world. And huge thank you to William for being so generous with his time. Cheers. Thank you.